I think we'll go ahead and get started. It looks like most of the group has been let in. Um, I'm going to, instead of starting with announcements, I'm going to end with announcements just because we have a packed agenda. The, the first thing I'd like to get into is um, a proposal for an antenna project here in the neighborhood. We have Christina on from the city, and I'm not sure if the other presenter has joined yet. Hi, hey, yep, I'm here. This is Chrissy Gilmore from Salt Lake City Planning. I'm the planner assigned to this petition. And the applicant, um, Mary, is actually also on the line. So I'll let her just do an overview of what they're proposing. Um, but just to get to the more technical stuff, um, this was approved about three years ago, but our city policies say that if you don't build it within a year, you have to reapply and get approval again. So that's why you're seeing this again, is that um, that time frame has expired. Thank you. Um, and could, I think I'd just like to ask you to give just a quick overview of the proposal, just kind of talk about where it is in the process and how folks can weigh in. Sure. Um, I'll talk about the process and then Mary can jump in on what's being proposed, but this is a conditional use that will be reviewed by the administrative hearing officer instead of the planning commission. And conditional uses go through what's called the early engagement process. And so that means that we notify the community council as well as neighbors within 300 feet of the, of the project area. Um, so a, a written notice was mailed out and then you have 45 days to comment or request that we present at one of your meetings. Um, following that 45 days, then the petition can go to what's called a public hearing where it'll be before the administrative hearing officer. And that's when you can also come and present and weigh any concerns that you have. And then the administrative hearing officer will either approve or deny the proposal. So that meeting would likely be scheduled in February because of the 45 days is expiring, um, I believe February 4th. Thank you. Okay, and Mary, if you want to jump in and you can just go over what you're proposing. Sure. Um, good evening, all. Thank you for having me. Um, as Chrissy said, this is a project that was previously approved for T-Mobile. Um, in the interim of when the project was approved and now, um, as you know, T-Mobile and Sprint went through a merger. And during that time period leading up to that and um, until shortly after that, all T-Mobile projects, all Sprint projects were put on hold. And so subsequently this CUP expired. So we are not changing anything about the project that was previously approved. Um, it is the same equipment. Um, basically it's an existing Verizon tower and um, T-Mobile is co-locating on it going um, below the existing antennas on there. Um, they're going to go at an 85 foot center line. Um, the tower itself is 100 feet with Verizon at 96 feet 8 inches. So the carriers have gotten better about co-locating with each other, um, you know, building their initial towers um, tall enough for co-location. They're past all that, you know, baloney about, oh, you know, we don't play nice together. Um, they figured out ways to do it because it's quite frankly, it's, it's more cost effective for them than to build a new tower. And nobody wants to see a bunch of uh, towers all over the city too. So um, basically it is uh, six eight foot antennas and three four foot antennas going on there. It's gonna be for 4G and 5G technology. Um, voice. Um, and they are expanding the Lease area, the, the ground space area, adding a um, 12 by 24 square foot um, chain link enclosure for T Mobile's equipment. So, and I can share my screen if you like to see those plans. Sure, I think I'd just like to give folks a, a chance to look at it, and then if there's any questions from the community, give them a chance to ask. Um, but uh, yeah, if you wouldn't mind sharing, you should have the ability to share your screen. that work hopefully it's starting yes it's yep there we go okay so um let me see if you can 
I'll just circle. So this is the location of the um, cell tower. So this is legacy view. And then um, this is on the south portion of the parcel. And then I will see if I can. And then, um, oh, and here's the, um, sorry, my screen's a little slow. There we go. On the left is the existing tower, and then on the right shows the proposed new antennas that would be co located, which are, so these would be the new antennas. Thank you. Um, are there any questions from the audience? I, if you're raising your hand, I apologize, I can't see you. If you would just put it in the chat, then I can call on you that way. All right, I don't see anything. Uh, so what I think we're gonna do, thank you for coming, Chrissy and Mary. I don't think we need to take any action on this. If we just wanted to have an opportunity to look at the proposal. Thank you for joining us tonight. Great, thank you for the opportunity. All right, take care. Appreciate it. Um, with that, let's move on to Josh from the mayor's office. I saw that him and uh, Council Member Johnson has joined. So let's let uh, Josh go first and then we'll have Council Member Johnson. Thanks, Turner. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Josh Arroyo. I'm the community liaison in the mayor's office uh, for District 2 and 1 and 2. So I just have a few things um, to get through today just uh, to share just a couple of events coming up. Um, so first of all, next Tuesday, uh, January 26th at 7 p.m., the mayor will be delivering her second state of the city address, and that will be, um, there won't be any audience uh, there live, so this will just be streamed um, live on Facebook and YouTube, and uh, I believe on SLC TV as well, uh, for those that get that channel. Uh, that will also have live interpretation to ASL in Spanish, and uh, that will be next Tuesday at 7 p.m. So there should be more information coming on that um, on social media. Uh, just mark that on your calendars if you're interested in watching that speech. Also, next week, uh, the Racial Equity and Policing Commission will be hosting a community listening session and that will be next week, Thursday, January 28th at 6 p.m. And uh, the purpose of the commission, uh, the, the listening session is to uh, gain some different perspectives throughout the community on policing in Salt Lake City. And um, so audience, uh, anyone that wants to participate can participate uh, via phone through text message. You can you know, text a question or, or uh, input and you can do that anonymously as well. Or uh, online also, there'll be a dedicated uh, social media hashtag to direct questions through. And then answers will be posted and shared with viewers in real time. So that is happening next Thursday um, at 6 p.m. If you wanna mark your calendars for that. Also, the Racial Equity and Policing Commission does have a, a website that you can visit. It's slcrepcommission.com. So I'll just, um, I'm just going to leave that in the chat um, for anyone that's interested in visiting. I had to take a look at the work of the, uh, of the commission and about upcoming listening sessions as they'll be uh, doing a few of these over the course of the next few months. Also, sorry, I lost my uh, spot here. Um, just an, a piece of news, a piece of information from our sustainability uh, department. The uh, brown curbside cans for compost will not be collected between January 25th and March 5th in order to save fuel costs and reduce emissions during a period of low demand. So that between January 25th and March 5th, those will not be collected. So that is from our uh, sustainability department. And that is all I have for right now as by way of announcement. And I'll be happy to take any questions for anyone that has any. 
Any question for the mayor's office? Right. I don't see any. Thanks for putting that link in the chat, Josh. We'll put that out on Facebook as well. Uh, with that, let's move on to Council Member Johnson. Uh, thanks, Turner. Probably can take mostly questions tonight, although uh, we can do a quick update on some homeless or unsheltered um, services. If you haven't heard these updates yet, we have been working as a city, we've been working with the Salt Lake Valley Coalition to End Homelessness uh, to identify ways to help those who are unsheltered right now. Um, and so they've opened in the past month uh, a facility in Mill Creek, a city up on the east uh, sort of bench area, 30, I want to say 33rd South, um, about 60 beds there for men. And then 100 and probably 130, 140 beds out of the airport in on the west end of North Temple up by the airport. Uh, those are both um, temporary housing for the winter time. So probably through the middle of April or so. Uh, along with the uh, resource center beds, uh, the youth resource center, as well as um, some motel rooms we've been using for several years for women, particularly in Salt Lake City. Uh, we have about, about 80 beds there. Uh, this year is unique in that there's uh, federal CARES funding, COVID funding, that is paying for a stay home, stay safe um, housing option for uh, those who are homeless, who are over the age of 65, or have underlying health issues that make them more susceptible um, to complications with COVID. So they've been in a separate um, hotel setting for the last several months, and that's funded, uh, I think, at least through April, maybe a little longer than that. Um, and then there's also a Salt Lake Valley um, Health Department running a quarantine and isolation center that's serving a lot of the unsheltered who are positive for COVID um, through, their, um, uh, through their infection period. So all those put together, uh, we've probably got a little more than 1,800 beds but as you've probably noticed, if you're around town, there's still quite a, a number of folks still outside. Some of the camps um, were actually quite vacated initially when a lot of them went into one of these settings, especially the airport inn, but they left all their tents up, all their materials for other folks to use. Um, and so some places looked like they were full, but they weren't. Um, I think the Fifth South one under the bridge, Camp Last Hope, um, was fairly vacant and then uh, a camp clear out happened on Main Street and a lot of them moved southwest to that camp on, under the viaduct um, and up along 5th you'll see them there by um, uh, the roofing supply company border. Uh, so this I know the mayor uh, his office is still working on their community commitment plan. Uh, Michelle Hoon is the city's um, manager of homeless kind of services and so I've probably given her number out to a number of you. Uh, they're also working through Volunteers of America's outreach team. Generally, what will happen is the outreach team can go out any day um, to any camp and do outreach to these folks. Um, help if they're willing to come into shelter beds or to other motel placements, get them in immediately. Help them store their stuff in a place for your stuff, which is uh, near Rio Grande. Uh, the city's operated for a number of years now. Um, and also can transport them into to beds. If they don't want to come into um, any of those beds, they can also offer them basic needs. Um, we have some tents, not a lot, um, sleeping bags, blankets, clothing. Uh, they can do some basic food items. They've done a health department and Fourth Street Clinic outreach for medical outreach to folks. Um, a lot of education on COVID and um, a lot of testing as well for folks who want to be tested for COVID symptoms. Uh, so that's actively happening. Um, and we can post that information for you all if that'd be helpful. Uh, I know we have quite a few folks who are uh, along the river under the bridges right now. Um, Bend of the river, we've had quite a few folks over there recently. Uh, and then even uh, going north up towards the Fair Park, a, a lot of folks as well. So uh, there is there are active efforts. We still need more though. Uh, oh, the Three Creeks Confluence Bridge and Park um, construction has restarted on that. You'll probably see um, the crews out there right now. They got the second bridge in, and I think a lot of the concrete work uh, for the banks is uh, 
complete, I want to say, a lot of the boulders as well. Um, so I'm optimistic they will finish that uh, sooner than later this year. Um, so I look forward to some announcements on that coming forward. And then I think the last thing, Turner, uh, the city is going to do some more outreach along uh, for the uh, water park property. Um, there was outreach based on outreach to talk about the current state of the water park and the options um, about rehab versus demolition and those kind of questions. So that happened. A second outreach is about specifically what to do now. Uh, the plan is to demo uh, most if not all that park. Um, and then there's a separate question about what do we do with the land? It has to be open space and park for the city. It can't be developed. Um, and there's a lot of ideas about a regional park, um, all abilities park, keeping the hill for various activities, um, some water features potentially, um, rebuilding all or part of the water park. I thought uh, there's a great idea about a wave pool for surfing. Um, I think everything's on the table for this. So as they come out, um, please pass this around to folks. Absolutely. I know you're doing your own visioning um, study as well, I've done that. Um, so hopefully these can be merged together. Yeah. Um, well, one thing, if you could just flag the bend in the river camp, if the, if the conversation comes up about prioritization, I've had quite a few people reach out to me and there's been a lot of fires and just different things there. It's pretty yeah. disruptive, so. Yeah, we have had a lot of calls there. I've reported a lot to Michelle about uh, uh, near the outdoor um, classroom. Um, on that area, I think there's a propane tank being used at one point down there as well. So uh, it's on their radar. I think, um, I know the outreach workers have gone down there a lot, Turner, the VOA folks. I've talked to them about it and they keep going down there. Um, I think the health department's a question because they're, they haven't been willing to go and post and go in without police support. And um, we haven't had a lot of police to do support, to be honest with you. So I think that's been a bit of a, a dilemma for them. And they've focused some of their efforts on the big camps. So I think we get kind of caught in the middle of being a small camp um, with some stretch of resources. Um, I will keep Michelle uh, up on that one though. Thank you. Uh, does anyone else have questions or comments? I see one in the, um, in the chat, how many of those overflow shelter beds are empty, available to the public? Um, last I knew, the airport in Hat was full. I think they could max out unofficially at probably close to 150. Um, initially, they thought 120 would be enough, but it's not. So 150, I think, is what they're doing. And it was full last I heard. Um, the Mill Creek facility has 60, I think, 60 beds, and it was full last I heard. Um, that one tends to fluctuate a little bit, so there may be some for men there. The resource centers themselves are are, are tricky to um, know. So what happens in a resource center is, say, the Geraldine Women's one has 200 beds. Um, some of those beds um, people can reserve for multiple nights if they're say they're working and they're working late. They can't just check in all the time, so they can have a bed reserved for a few nights in a row. Some of the beds are night to night, so they turn over every day. So what happens is first thing in the morning at 7 a.m., if you're in a night tonight bed, they'll ask you, do you need this bed tonight as well, this following night? And so a lot of them tend to say yes. And so between 7 a.m. and say 9 a.m., um, they will fill up their beds oftentimes. Um, I think last night they were 189, so they had about 11 beds free, give or take. Um, and so during the day, it looks like they may be full because they've been reserved by individuals for that night. Um, about dinner time, they go and they recheck with everybody. They ask them to come back in the facility if they've been out or call in so they can verify they're going to need that bed that night. And they do a separate count. At that point, some beds may open up. So if there's, say, 10 beds open up at that point, which is pretty rare, but 10 or so, um, then sometimes there's folks waiting in the lobby. Sometimes they're calling in. Uh, there's the 801-990-9999 number that anybody can call. The public can call that number. And it's um, it's staffed 24 hours a day. Sometimes it's a little busier than others. Uh, that's really the main entry point to call and ask about bed availability. And then they'll fit person into what available beds there are um, as much as they can throughout the day. What you'll see sometimes, or well, pretty frequently actually, is they'll do a count um, and they'll try and fill their beds up as much as they possibly can with anybody they can coming in. Um, generally, they've, um, they'll do a count about midnight at the Geraldine 
and then another count uh, throughout the night, about 7 a.m. is the official count. Oftentimes, people will leave before 7 a.m. Uh, for various reasons. Sometimes someone work early or they just leave for their needs. Um, so the official count comes at 7 a.m. and sometimes it looks low, but then within the next two hours, it may fill up again. That's why those numbers look kind of funky sometimes. The best option is to call that 990-9999 number um, and, and get an answer from them. Um, if you do run into uh, trouble with that, um, you can contact, I work for Volunteers of America, so you can contact me and I can see if I can help out. Uh, I think right now there were some women's beds available last night in the women's um, facility, Geraldine on 7 South and State. Uh, I think there was some at the South Salt Lake men's one as well for men. The Miller, which is on 13, 14 South, the co-ed one, uh, has tended to be a little more full recently. I think there's a lot of demand for couples to stay together. Um, but I think there are probably are some beds in all three facilities uh, tonight if people uh, know there's a need. Uh, yeah, the uh, East Door for VRH in Rio Grande. Yeah, I, I think prior to this winter when we had this 120 bed stay home, stay safe, uh, 60 bed Mill Creek, 150 bed airport in. Yeah, they were always full. I mean, it was next to impossible to find a bed in those facilities, except for maybe between the first and the sixth of the month. Um, they tend to be sort of a drop during that week and then they'd fill up again. Um, but with all these overflow uh, housing beds this winter, there's a little more capacity in those resource centers, uh, which is really the goal. We need, we need that capacity. I think I see Ashley's got her hand up. Uh, yeah, so I just I just had a question about the Rio Grande project, and I saw that the Salt Lake Trib released an article about the budget, which the council, from what I remember, was in charge of, and that 80% of the funds went to police force, which has just been shown time and time again, city after city, that that is not the way to fix homelessness, to treat the problem at all. It just makes every situation worse. And I just wanna know why 80% of the budget went to just police clearing out camps just for them to set up another camp down the road. Uh, Operation Rio Grande was done by Greg Hughes with state money from the legislature when he was chair, when he was uh, uh, Speaker of the House. So that money was state. Um, it was tens of millions. I think it was, what, how much? 60, 65 million, maybe 70. Um, but that was state money. The city did not do that. They consulted with us about treatment beds. And so we worked to get more substance use treatment beds open through Odyssey House. Uh, so right now, actually, it's probably as good a time as I've ever seen to get into substance abuse treatment in the county or the city. Um, there are more beds available than we've ever, ever seen. Um, but you're right. The audit was clear that most of that went to state highway patrol and police um, to enforce stuff. Um, I think we're running into the same issue this winter. Uh, there, there's a lot of demand. Uh, I'm getting calls multiple times per week from businesses and residents about uh, camps. Um, and crime and camps, and they're equating the two together, which I'm not sure is always true. Um, but there's a lot of demand on the city right now for these kind of two issues coming on simultaneously, particularly in say ballpark neighborhood, uh, North Temple to some extent and some downtown. Um, I don't know there's a direct link between, between crime and the homeless, to be honest with you. I think the crime has a lot to do with the economy and, and COVID right now. Um, but folks are clamoring for a police presence. Last night at the city council, um, the police department asked us to backfill vacant positions. They're down uh, at least 70, it may be up to 80 at this point, from their current position at the beginning of the year. Um, and what's happened is that even with the rise in crime and reports of crime, so responses, uh, we have fewer officers to do it. So the response time to 911 calls and to general calls has been way, way high. Um, it's not uncommon to have multiple hours to wait. I think Nigel Swabi on uh, North Temple waited five hours for one, one day for an assault down there. Um, so we're running into that problem with response and investigation on the back end. Um, and there's a lot of pressure to get more money into police. And so we approved to backfill those positions for the police department to try and get it up as soon as we can. The second question is the community commitment program from the, from the city. Um, is trying to get people into shelter beds or, or housing options um, and keep camps from becoming embedded and larger. So there's public health issues going on. The trouble is if they're not going in or there's not enough beds, 
um, you're right, it's getting moved city, uh, around the city. And right now we've got a lot of beds, but come April or May, a lot of that winter um, funding goes away and those aren't options anymore. And so 120, 150, 65, uh, when COVID funding goes away, that other 120 goes away as well. We could have several hundred folks looking for some of those beds again and we're stuck. Um, the city's doing some for affordable housing, but we, I mean, we're putting in probably 5 million per year and then a couple other sort of depending on the funding. Um, the state's putting in about 2 million a year total um, towards that for the entire state, not for Salt Lake City. Um, and so in my discussions last week with the State Affordable Housing Commission, it was made clear to me uh, that a lot of legislatures have no interest in doing ongoing funding for deeply affordable housing. Um, so there's no bill coming forward this year at the state legislature for that. Um, wow. What we're anticipating is they may backfill about $5 million one time that they didn't fund last year when they were <coughs> <clears throat> that's one time money it go as soon as it's gone it's gone um and so i'm i'm personally a little frustrated because we don't have an end game here um there's not housing coming on that's at the affordability level we need um and we have to keep working on services for every folks but we can do as many services as we want but as soon as you get out of treatment where are you going to go i mean that's a, the real problem we're running into and if you have mental health services it's chronic and you need long-term case management we run into the fact of where we find them um, for an outreach worker, moving people around the city is probably the worst idea. We can't track them very well. We can't offer services consistently to them. Um, at least if we know where they're camping consistently, the outreach team can go out with medical support, with um, food or clothing or other needs and know where to find them, even for the housing um, paperwork. So when you apply for, for housing subsidies, they'll send you paperwork in the mail. They have to do mailing for some idiotic reason. Um, and so you need an address. So they'll usually send it, if you're homeless, they'll send it to the outreach worker's um, office. And then the outreach worker goes and finds a person, sign the form, whatever they got to do to get that going. And that's sometimes the worst part of this. So if we can't find them, there's always this time frame for HUD and it, it expires and we can't get them the voucher. And so it gets really frustrating. We sort of are, are sort of running around in circles to some extent. Short answer, I think personally is we got to keep doing as much as we can as a city for affordable housing and putting money towards that. I think we have one new building, hopefully done this year of 65 units. Um, we completed Pamela's place, which is 100 units and um, city center, which had 75 units and I think another 75 coming on. Um, uh, we're finished this year. So there is some movement from the city end and from the redevelopment agency end from Salt Lake City, but we're not seeing a whole lot else outside of that. Um, that's part of the reason everything's coming downtown again. This is where the housing's going. This is where the services are going. Um, we're not seeing a whole lot else happening in the county. Um, or maybe Ogden's doing some, St. George is doing some, um, but most of the folks are, are struggling real much about this. So uh, in the short term, we may see a lot more folks coming downtown for services, housing or other things. Um, and we're sort of in the bind of saying, do we do it all ourselves as a city and pay for all of it for the Wasatch Front essentially? Um, do we wait and struggle with what we're seeing right now until somebody else will step up? Um, it's a hard one. I wish I had a better answer for you, Ashley. I just, I just also want to say that I, I don't know if I necessarily like approve of just police patrolling presence. I know a lot of people call in for that, but there is like a backhand of police patrolling uh, lower income neighborhoods and minority neighborhoods and stuff like that. So I don't know if I necessarily agree with them just coming in, breaking up camps and just spreading people around. And also I've seen slight increased police presence in my neighborhood on my street, but there is all of the, the drug usage and the homes camp under the bridge. None of that at all has been watched closely. None of that has even been addressed and none of that has, I've, I haven't seen any decrease and I've only seen an increase and we ha do have police presence in the neighborhood. So I don't know if I agree with certain calls asking for more patrolling. I, I agree. I think what you'll see Ashley is you're right. Police are not going under the bridge. They're not going to find homeless people. That's not their job. Um, what's happening is the health department won't go in to do a camp abatements without police presence. Um, that's their directive on their end. And so um, the city said, we'll put Salt Lake City, and this is, the mayor's office runs police and all that. Um, we'll put police in there to help the health department. So it's this vicious cycle where the health department won't go in because 
um, there are some folks who are protesting them doing the abatement, and then they won't go in without police, so the police has to come in, and then the police get sort of in the middle of it, and it becomes an anti-police or sort of triangular thing, and it gets messy. I agree. I'd much rather everyone go into um, temporary housing for the renter at least um, and avoid yeah. this whole situation. Um, but the police in general are not being sent out in the city for homeless stuff. I think they don't want to do that, but they're stuck because that's the response that was sort of started earlier on. Um, I think it's a tricky thing because some folks are blaming homeless for increased crime. Um, and I'm not sure that's- I agree with you. I don't think that's, that's the problem. I think it's definitely more COVID and I don't know, the people I've seen doing more crime in my neighborhood, none of them have been homeless. It's been more gang related and stuff like that. So I agree with you on that. Yeah, I mean, there are homeless who are committing crimes. Don't get me wrong. I mean, but yeah. to say that the homeless are the reason for their spike in crime, I think is unfounded completely. Um, yeah. So we gotta be careful in how we talk about that, like you're saying. I mean, the whole thing's a mess right now, I'll be honest. Yeah, it, it is sad that it's up to the state right now. I didn't, I think they kind of, they kind of threw it on the city council. They were like, it's all on them. The budget's on them. They're in control of everything. And now that's just not yeah. the case. So. I know. I mean, we control the city budget. And so when the city allocates funds for um, cleanups, police, all that, that is definitely on me and the council. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Operation Rio Grande was really uh, Greg Hughes running it down. The one, I'll say one bright spot potentially. Cross my fingers on this one. Um, there is a bill to uh, reorganize the state response to homelessness um, that the legislature requested a study be done on by the Gardner Institute. It's in front of them right now. There'll be a bill run to institute that with somebody in the governor's office of management and budget sort of directly responsible for all homeless stuff in the state. And then this tier of responsibility down to the regions and the cities. Um, the big piece that may be helpful in that is that all the private donors and the funders, the private money out there, the wealthy philanthropists and businesses and corporations, some of them have been a little nervous and uh, about the system. They're not sure if it's on the right track because we seem to see an increase. Now, I would argue the increase has a lot to do with the economy, frankly. And if you're in Salt Lake City, you're seeing an increase. If you're outside, you're seeing your folks leave and come to Salt Lake City. But regardless, um, if they have more faith in the system, we may be able to marshal a lot more of their private money coming in um, and I think that got, it's got to go to a building housing, temporary, permanent, all of that. If that works, then we could have an infusion of cash, which could be a big benefit to build more, um, or at least be able to, um, uh, to purchase some existing buildings and retrofit them into lower, deeply affordable housing. Uh, the other thing that I'm pushing for the city is an inclusionary zoning ordinance. Um, I, I think we have to have a targeted inclusionary zoning, which would mandate for all for instance, all new um, multifamily construction in the city above a certain number of units, percentage has to be deeply affordable, below 40% AMI. Um, it's been controversial. There'll be a legislative bill run this year that says if you do that as a city, you've got to subsidize it, incentivize it. I'm fine with that. Uh, I think that's the only way we're going to get deeply affordable housing spread across the entire city so it's equitable. Um, but that's still on the horizon. It hasn't been drafted yet, and there's still some debate about that. But I think it's got to happen sooner than later. Yeah. Real quick. Sorry, Turner. Um, there was just a few people asking what's considered affordable housing. Um, and for what I've seen, that's a thousand dollars. No, I think it depends on what you mean by affordable. So when I say deeply affordable, generally I'm referring to 40% median income or below. Um, and so uh, I have to look at the numbers again, but for a single individual, we're talking about say $15,000 or less per year. A lot of that's people on fixed incomes, right? Um, now, affordability means anything below mm -hmm. the market. And so uh, as a social worker, when I bought my first house in, in Poplar Grove, um, I probably needed some affordable housing. It wasn't as bad as it is now, but I couldn't afford the market because the market right now for a, a studio in Salt Lake City brand new is probably, what, 1100 maybe 12 somewhere in there. That's the market. 1100 yeah. So anything below yeah. the market right now is, is technically affordable. But as you know, if it's $1,000 a month for a studio and I can't afford that, it's not affordable. So when we talk about affordability, it's a whole lot of things. The biggest need we've got by far is for people who are making 40% of the median income right now and below. That is our biggest gap. And that would 
um, also deal with folks on fixed incomes, those with disabilities, those who are on, uh, um, on house right now or are not working, or they have some combination of that because they're probably not gonna get out of that, that bracket. But we're also, when, the, when people come to the city and ask for loans, uh, we're asking for that first, second is 60% and below, third is 80%. So for some folks will sort of mix a variety of those in there so that say teachers could afford a place at 80% AMI, um, social workers, whoever, public servants, those kind of things. We need all of it, but when I, deeply affordable for me is that lowest level where it's gonna be one third of your income probably per month. So we're gonna subsidize hundreds and hundreds of dollars per month per unit. It's, it's, not, it's not cheap, um, but it's what we need to do. But yeah, when we say about affordability and they say, well, it's 80%, therefore the rent's like $1,000 a month. Yeah, I, I know that's not affordable for most of us. I, I get it. Um, but it's one of those technical terms about where on that scale you are. Thank you. Um, I don't know how to lower my hand, Turner. I, it's okay. I'll, well, I'll see if I can do that. Um, I, in the interest of time, I want to move on, but I did want to let everyone know who's watching that, and Andrew, you'll be getting an email from me tonight, actually. Uh, we're doing a new thing where we're going to do community conversations, which are longer meetings where we can dive into depth on these topics. Um, so we'll be inviting you to do one so we can, what we'd like to do is just get an understanding of how the whole system works and the, the we've been talking about the new model and all these different pieces. So um, we'll be coordinating that with you and, and doing a longer conversation about this issue. Thank you. Next, uh, I'd like to move on to Detective Oliver really quickly. If you just give a quick update. Sure, Turner, thanks. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, right, are there any questions, uh, concerns? Uh, it sounds like there's some concerns about uh, Ben in the River. We've been um, actively watching uh, and, and trying to patrol down there with our the bike squad. Um, it sounds like we also need to get down near uh, Ashley's off uh, 13th, I believe. Ashley, is that correct? Yes, that is, yeah. Yeah, um, and anyway, anywhere along the Jordan River Parkway right now is is being patrolled by the, the west side bike squad when they can get down there. Um, the, the tough part is North Temple's still active, uh, specifically around the Arctic Circle area, and that's where they, they've been tasked to. So, um, and unfortunately, that's where they're, they're spending a lot of their time. Uh, they're probably getting multiple felony arrests hourly out of that North Temple uh, Arctic Circle area. Um, we're just trying to, to break that down as much as we can right there. Um, as far as numbers, and it's, it's kind of like a broken record, but during the winter hours, we're seeing an uptick in, in stolen cars. Um, and that's due, it has a lot to do with um, people warming their cars up in the morning. Um, if you listen to the scanner or listen to a, a, any kind of scanner in the, in the morning, you'll hear uh, stolen car after stolen car because they're being warmed up. So I highly, highly recommend you do not warm up uh, your, your cars in the morning. Um, and I was reminded the last meeting in uh, West Point that uh, there is an ordinance against um, having your car run anyway. So there's two things to, to look at as far as uh, what we can and can't do with the vehicles. Um, but if we can continue to just work on, on keeping our cars locked up uh, and not running in the mornings, um, we're gonna cut down on those stolen vehicles a lot. Uh, any other questions, concerns? Uh, I just wanted to know, is there any way to be able to track where the, the Glendale Bike Squad is? Because I understand that it's, it's just more crime over there, so they're over there a lot. But is there any way to know how often they are like in my area? Is there any way to track that? Um, I can look and see if we can, we can start something like that. We, we've started a new system. So uh, if you haven't heard, the CIU unit's gone. Um, that was one per one officer per district. And now there's, there's basically three officers for the whole city. And so we're tasked with each, um, each division. So I'm, I've moved my office over to, to Pioneer. So I'm in direct communication with the uh, bike lieutenant. So I will see if I can get um, that and maybe report on the, that every month on what, what and where they spent their time. Absolutely. That'd be great, thanks. Uh -huh. um, and then I just wanted to ask really quickly, I'm getting a lot of emails and stuff and seeing a lot of posts about gunshots and wondering if they are all gunshots or if we have overactive fireworks users or if you know that. <laughs> um, 
we have had a huge influx uh, of gang drive-by shootings and shootings in general. Uh, and it has to do with gang, gang involvement in the West side. So uh, I can't promise you that, that what you're sounding, what you're hearing is gunshots, but uh, we do want those reported because usually how it goes on a call, if, if we get a report of a gunshot and it's not verified by another neighbor, um, it's harder for us to, to get into the, the, the correct area. So if you do hear a gunshot that you think is a gunshot, please call it in. Continue to call it in so we can kind of get, kind of triangulate where that those calls are coming from. And it's easier for us to find out what's going on with that point. So don't just assume that your neighbors called it in. Please call if you hear anything that's suspicious. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Thanks, Turner. My, my number and email stayed the same. So continue to reach out. Okay, and CD asked, who are they supposed to call about gunshots? Is it 911? Yes. Yeah, if you if you feel like you hear a gunshot, absolutely 911. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any last questions? Thank you, Detective Oliver. Thank you. Take care. All right. Uh, the next thing I'm going to move on to, Representative Romero will be joining us. Uh, she said around 8 o'clock. So when she joins, we're going to turn the agenda over to her. Next, I'd like to move into our council uh, elections. We have, uh, you may know, I'm going to give a little bit of background, but we have uh, had had our, our secretary position empty back in January of 2020. When I was elected chair, I switched from secretary to chair, and my secretary position was essentially empty, and Jeremy has been filling that role graciously, as well as being our treasurer. So, um, what we're doing tonight will be filling both our secretary and our treasurer roles. We have, because we're all online right now, we're planning to do the election right here with folks who are live on uh, Zoom. If you are watching the live stream and want to participate in the election, I can put the chat uh, or the, the link to Zoom in the chat. So join the Zoom meeting if you'd like to vote in the election. Um, the way that we're going to do it, we're going to do, we're going to use Zoom's uh, base, basic technology. So what we're going to do is ask for folks to self-nominate or you can nominate other folks uh, who are here on the call. And if you would put those names in the chat, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to explain um, a proposed committee structure what, so that we have a few minutes uh, to prepare and let candidates introduce themselves. So if you are interested, would you please put your name in the chat um, and, and the position that you're interested in. What we'll do after this is I'll, add, I'll call on you one by one, give you a chance to just introduce yourself, uh, explain your interest, uh, that type of thing. And then for those, if we have competitive elections and uh, because it's an election, if one person wins and another doesn't, we have so many opportunities to be involved right now that as soon as this meeting is over, there's room for everyone. So we want you on a committee. We want you involved. Uh, we know it's a weird time to have to do elections, but we, we just can't uh, continue without a full board. And But we want folks to be involved, whether it's on a committee, as a board member, uh, there are chances to be involved. So don't feel like tonight is the only opportunity. There are a lot of opportunities coming down the road. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'll give you all a second. If you're interested, just please put your name in the chat with the position you're interested in. And then I will call on folks for each position to just let you introduce yourself uh, and explain why you're interested in a, in a given position. I'm going to start getting the poll ready. So would folks like a, an explanation of what the two positions are? Kind of an explanation of duties. I haven't seen any names come in. So what I'm going to do is give an explanation. Um, I'm going to put the Zoom chat or the Zoom link in Facebook really quick. And are we still able to nominate other people as well and have them accept or decline? Yes. You can nominate others. 
Uh, for those watching on Facebook, I'm getting the link now and we'll be putting it in the chat for you. All right, for those of you on Facebook, I just put the link in the chat. So if you join us on Zoom. Um, let's see. So it looks like we have a candidate for treasurer. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go chronologically of who expressed interest. Um, why don't we go, Cody, why don't you first explain, get, introduce yourself, sorry. Hi, uh, my name is Cody. Um, I've grew up in Utah and California. Right now, I'm currently a housing case manager for Chronically Homeless for Housing Connect, which was the housing authority for the county of Salt Lake. Um, I went to the University of Utah, uh, got my bachelor's there and my master's at the at USC uh, in community development. Uh, I have a lot of experience in victim advocacy, program evaluation, and homelessness in general. Uh, like Turner said, I'm interested in the treasurer position. Uh, I did that in college for the National Society of Leadership and Success. So I have a little experience that. Um, I've been living in Glendale for about three years now. And I got involved with the community council earlier this year. And I have three dogs named Hanky, Merlin, and Luna. And I like to cook and play tennis. Well, I really wanted to get involved in the community and I really like personal finance. So I thought treasure would be a good option. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Taylor, do you want to go next? Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Taylor and I was sort of interested here in the secretary position. Um, my sort of some of my interest in it is I know that Turner's mentioned wanting to get more materials out in Spanish. I am um, fluent in Spanish and I served in the Peace Corps in Costa Rica for two years. Uh, my background professionally, I right now I work for a wildlife conservation nonprofit as an operations coordinator. A lot of my roles and responsibilities include taking minutes for board meetings and, and such. Um, let's see, what else? I. I live in the neighborhood near the Peace Gardens, and uh, I've enjoyed just getting involved over the past several months. So thank you, Turner, for uh, keeping me in the loop. Thanks. And then Josh, or Joshua, sorry. Hi, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, hi, hi, my name is Joshua yep. Aguila. I'm a local business owner. I've uh, been a Glendale resident since 2016. Um, I own Eagles Painting. Uh, I'd like to just share uh, a little bit uh, and give back more to the community. Uh, I've been involved. I started getting involved last year uh, before, the COVID hit, before the COVID hit in the personal meetings uh, down at the library. And I'm just gonna want to become more of a participant uh, instead of an observer right now, and uh, like to get the experience of local government. And I think this would be a great opportunity for uh, a little bit of leadership and uh, some greater um, skills to learn. Thank you. Thank you. Um, with that, it, I'm going to just put it out there one more time. And if there's any other folks that want to kind of self nominate or nominate someone else, now would be the time. I'm going to set up the poll shortly. So I'll give it just a few more minutes or seconds. Um, I think what I will do, we'll set up the poll for the secretary's race since you both expressed an interest in that. Um, an alternative would be, since we only have three candidates, we could make a motion to have the secretary election and then 
another motion to appoint an at-large board member. This would be the direction I would prefer to go since we have three folks that have expressed interest in being involved. Um, I'm wondering how folks feel about that kind of thoughts. It would have to come from the membership. So I won't, I will not be making the motion. It needs to come from the membership. Can I make a motion to open up a third position as you suggested? Is that what it, what, or like a broad, what was it, board member? Yeah, that would work. We would, we, we can uh, have an, an at large board member. The bylaws allow us to do that. So it would be first motioning to create that position. It looks like Diane would second that. And then we go to a general vote. Um, and then we'll hold our secretary election at, with knowing that the folk or the person that uh, was not elected secretary would then fill that other position. Uh, does that make sense to everyone? Okay. So uh, I'm gonna say that your motion and Diane's second puts it on the agenda. Let's, I think instead of trying to do like a roll call vote or have everyone vote, what I do like to do is uh, make a motion that we do it by acclamation. If anyone is opposed, uh, then we could, we would entertain that opposition. But uh, first I just kind of like to find out, is there anyone who's opposed to this? Okay, so with that, uh, give me just a few seconds. I'm gonna get the secretary uh, election posted for you all. Uh, give me just one moment and I'll get this. You're hungry. Okay, you should all see that poll. It may appear as a chat or a little box on your screen. You should have been notified. I don't think I got anything. Oh, just kidding. I did. I don't know if it notifies or not. That's looks like we have one or two more people. All right, I'm going to give you ten more seconds, and then we'll close it. Congratulations, Taylor. Uh, you'll be joining us as our secretary. And Joshua, you'll be joining us as an executive or as a, a board member, an at-large board member. So I will, as soon as we're done tonight, I will email you and get you on our board meeting calendar. We meet, uh, and this is good information for residents as well. We meet the uh, week before the board meeting or before the community council meeting for our board meeting. So we meet the uh, second Wednesday of the month as a board and the third Wednesday of the month here for our community council meetings. Um, and I'll make sure we get you invited to that. The next thing I'd like to, to move on to, and this will be a good example of what our at-large board members help with. Obviously all of our board members help with keeping the organization going. Um, I'm bringing up tonight, I'd like to make a proposal and we will not be voting on this tonight. Um, but I wanted to bring it up so that we could have the initial conversation, spend a couple of months working on language, and then vote on it later on in the year. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. So one of the things uh, that we have been working on as a community council is setting up a variety, are you guys seeing um, uh, bylaws or what looks like bylaws? Yeah. Okay. Can you zoom a little just to make it bigger? Yes, I'm going to, let me just throw this in the chat and you may, I have to stop sharing for a second. It may be easier for you to open it on your own computer. If it gives issues opening it, I apologize and I'll zoom in. Um, I use Google Drive and I 
the permissions are always a nightmare. I am just going to change this so that folks can comment. OK, you should be able to click through that link now. And um, Ashley, would you mind putting it on Facebook so that folks can see that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just one moment, sorry. Um, OK, so what, we're, what I'd like to propose, we've been in the process of setting up committees. Um, and committees, we have to be voted on by the, uh, by the, the community in our community council meetings, uh, meetings such as tonight. And the bylaws provide us a lot of flexibility in terms of creating the committees. What I'd like to propose uh, as kind of a best practice for the community is that we require a charter uh, for the committee so that there's a formal document that kind of spells out the roles and responsibilities of that uh, position. And I can come back to that. Um, excuse, sorry, I'm in OK, I'll get right back to your question. And Gina, I'll get right back to your question as well. Um, but basically, a committee charter, I have an example of one. So we've talked a lot about how to engage in the dark sky uh, presentation we had a couple of months ago. And so a committee charter, what we would be doing is we'd be creating a committee with a mission statement. Uh, and, and some committees would have timelines. So I think it's a really good idea when you're putting together a committee to always have a date when that committee ends so that you can reevaluate and determine whether you want that committee to continue. And so I have put together a couple of outlines of what these charters could look like. Um, I will start sharing those in the chat as well. Uh, it's just examples of what we could create for each of the committees that we have. We've discussed having a dark sky committee to kind of look into what we could do as a community to promote dark sky uh, initiatives. We've for the past year been working on the Keep Glendale Beautiful chapter and affiliate here in Glendale. Uh, we need to get a committee approved for that and kind of take some next steps in getting organization going uh, as part of our affiliation process. And then the last is we've talked about creating a welcoming Glendale committee that would focus on making Glendale more welcoming. Uh, and, and Welcoming America focuses specifically on immigrants and refugees. Um, so we would be focused on just promoting policy change, uh, make, just making our community more welcoming of all of our neighbors. Um, and where we have these different committees, I think it makes sense to have a committee chair with a document that clearly lay, lays out how this is gonna work, how long it's going to last, uh, so that we can always refer back uh, as a committee and as a community to determine how things are going. Um, like I said, we won't vote on this tonight because it's the first time it's been brought up tonight, um, but we'll revisit it at subsequent meetings and just talk through things. We'll continue to advertise it on our social media We'd love your feedback on it. And as we get going, um, what I we can think about the way that we want committee leadership to work. Um, but in the bylaws, the membership would elect committees. So what I would propose is this year we create the committees, we add this language to the charter, and then we elect some committee chairs for these different organizations and committees uh, at subsequent meetings, maybe in February when we're meeting. Um, to start getting more folks involved in the council and doing more ongoing projects. Uh, I think this model would be pretty sustainable and I, I'm always uh, worried about accountability and making sure that uh, accountability exists and that we're moving forward with our different projects. So I wanted to bring that up in the context of the election tonight and the addition of a, a, an at-large board member because all of our board members help with all of our different projects uh, and can serve as committee chairs, can work with the membership. Um, so I wanted to bring this up as a proposal that we'll be, be revisiting in, in future meetings. Um, and then I've gotten a couple of questions in the chat. I never uh, finalized the treasurer election. 
So uh, my assumption was, and we can we need to make a motion on this. I apologize. My assumption would be that if the treasurer's race was uncontested, that Cody would win by acclamation, um, similar to how we would do another vacancy. And the reason we had the election for the secretary was because two folks had expressed interest in it. Um, how are folks feeling about that? I support it. <laughs> in, in no yeah, way. we support it. I think that's fine unless is anyone else wants to make themselves available. Yeah, we could do an election as well. Uh, well, I, I'll entertain a motion if someone would like to, to motion to do that. And Cody can't make the motion because he's in question. So it'll have to come from someone else. I make a motion and then we just acclimate Cody into the position. Thank you, Gina. Is there a second? I second that motion. Okay, thank you and okay. Uh, with that, we're gonna do it the same way we did the other vote uh, just by acclamation. So unless someone is opposed and wants to speak up, we'll just do it that way. All right. Sorry, that was seconded by? Uh, in okay. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, the next thing that we have on our agenda, I don't believe Representative Ramirez joined me yet. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll go to community updates or neighborhood updates. If you have a open-ended question or if you have something that wasn't covered on the agenda tonight that you'd like to bring up for a future agenda, I would love to hear those ideas, uh, concerns, questions, updates. Uh, Ken from Sorensen Center, if you want to give an update, uh, really the floor is open to whoever wants to go next for a few moments. Uh, thanks, Turner. This is Ken from the Sorensen Center. I'd love to just give a quick little update. Um, we are, are currently still kind of closed to the general public, but I did want to make sure that everybody knows that we are still open for the essential services that we provide on campus. So that's uh, through the Salt Lake City, Do Salt Lake Donated Dental Services. They are still providing dental services as they have throughout the pandemic. Um, and so um, you can go to their website or call them to make appointment for those services. We also are still providing youth programming um, and then the early Head Start program through Utah Community Action. At this point, we, we don't have um, a planned date for reopening for recreation programs and opening to the general public. Um, but I, I can say that we've had a positive note in terms of we've had construction, a construction project on campus for a while now. Um, the last kind of big part of it is going to be uh, work on the HVAC of the pool area. And I just got today that they're looking to do that work um, in March. So they should be starting on March 17th. Um, and so if and when the building's recreation programs open, we will be able to open the pool if that happens around April. So sorry, um, but just wanted to make sure everybody knows that, that the dental clinic is still fully operational. Thank you. And if anybody has any questions, please let me know. Thank you. Uh, anyone else with questions, comments, concerns? Give folks an opportunity. Okay. Um, I'm going to really quickly, I'll give you a couple of updates from the community council. Uh, and then if any other board members want to jump in and give updates, uh, I, I appreciate that as well. Um, the first update that I'm gonna talk about is the One Glendale plan. So for those of you uh, who don't know, for the past year, we have been working on crafting uh, uh, what we're calling the One Glendale Plan. We have two interns who have been working with us, uh, Lily and Brandon. They've spoken with many of you, um, but we're basically just trying to identify some primary areas of interest that are shared by basically everyone in the neighborhood. So we've done a mix of in-person one-on-one -on -one interviews. We've done some surveys. We've had conversation. We've gleaned things from the community council meetings. Uh, we've been basically trying to do a community-wide information gathering effort. 
And now we're going into the second phase of this, which is where we're going to try to survey the neighborhood very, very broadly and try to reach as many people as possible. And so what we'd like to ask of all of you tonight, I've shared two links in the chat. These are our surveys about the beginning of the plan. And so what we're starting to do now that we've started, we've, we've gathered all of this information, we're gonna start a draft version of the plan that we'll then bring back for the next couple of community council meetings. And our April meeting will be primarily dedicated to this, uh, to talk through verbiage and work on language, um, identify these areas of shared commitment, uh, just as a way of helping guide both the community council's direction and the way that we kind of interact with all of the various proposals we're asked to weigh in on. Uh, we get dozens and dozens of emails from the city on planning and zoning changes and everything um, and different projects. And so having a document like this would help with onboarding a new chair, maintaining some consistency between elections. Uh, it's not meant to be inflexible or like a law, but just to be kind of some shared ideas about ways that we can improve our neighborhood and identify some of the issues that exist here. So as you look at it, we've broken it into six different categories. So the first category of questions is waste recycling and sustainability, just identifying ways uh, of promoting a more sustainable neighborhood. Number two is transportation, looking at our different transportation systems. Um, maybe we need more crosswalks. Maybe we need traffic calming measures. I don't know. Um, that's what we're hoping to survey you on. The next is the Jordan River, since it's a defining feature of our neighborhood, the Three Creeks Confluence Project, and adjacent park areas. Uh, the next one is parks and open space more broadly. And the last is community identity and public art. So we, we have these six categories. It is an open-ended survey, and we'd, we'd appreciate if when you take it, if you could dedicate 10 or 15 minutes to sitting down and taking your time to thoughtfully complete the survey. It's the only survey uh, we're gonna do of this nature that's this open-ended. And so we would appreciate if you would spend some time on this and please share it with your neighbors, with folks that you know that live here in Glendale. Um, if, you, if you have folks that need to receive a printed version or that would need to do it over the phone or need any other accommodation, if you would please get in touch with me um, we want to make this as inclusive as possible. We do have it in English and Spanish. Um, and we just want to make sure that we're getting it out there as widely as possible. So uh, are there any questions about this? I know I kind of blazed through that, but I'd be happy to answer questions. And we're happy to print and mail them. Um, I can get it to folks in a variety of different platforms. Um, if we need additional languages, those types of things, let us know and we will work on them. But please encourage folks to spend, you know, five to 15 minutes working on this. Give us your thoughts. We want open-ended thoughts. Um, we ask, we, we want to make sure that your ideas are included and that everyone has a voice in this document. So please, if you would, uh, fill out the surveys and share them widely. We'll also start a marketing campaign on all of our social media this week. Uh, we're just waiting for the last of our graphics and such to be translated into Spanish. Uh, and now we have two folks who speak Spanish that'll be on our board. So we'll be able to turn around things uh, much quicker than we currently can. Um, any questions on this? All right. Again, if you run into people who need more support or need it to be done over the phone or something like that, please let me know and we can make accommodations to do that. We want to reach as many people as possible. So please share it far and wide with uh, our Glendale neighbors here. Uh, the next update I'd like to give you is, I'm gonna see if Damien is still on. Damien, um, maybe do you wanna give an update on the Keep Glendale Beautiful project? We just did, uh, I'll start a little bit. We just did a community cleanup on Monday for Martin Luther King Jr. Day, uh, where we cleaned up basically the Fife wetlands, the area out in front of Smith's, and the northern part of Jordan Park along the river there. We cleaned up over 300 pounds of garbage, 
and it was primarily our neighbors who all came out. So we'll be organizing more cleanups and a bunch of different opportunities around keeping the neighborhood beautiful uh, in the coming years and through the, the Keep Glendale Beautiful project. But I'll let Damien talk about what he's doing. Yeah, so for those of you who don't know, <clears throat> Keep Glendale Beautiful is um, a national or it's an affiliate with the national program, Keep America Beautiful. And what that does for us is it just secures a program that ideally will last into the future, um, long beyond my internship, long beyond um, ideally even Turner's um, being the chair. And it just creates a lasting program that makes um, cleanliness and beautification for the neighborhood a priority. Um, and it's also a source for training and funding um, for these cleanup events. Uh, so right now we're working on the report to make our affiliation um, certified. And I'm just working on some of the various aspects of the report. Um, one that could use some involvement from anybody who's willing. In the future, we're going to be doing a litter index. So some identified routes throughout the neighborhood, we're gonna um, drive in a vehicle actually and give it a rating as to the severity of litter that's present. And that is required uh, for the initial certification and it's also going to be required annually um, to keep that affiliation. Um, right now, that's the only thing that's on the radar that would need um, um, that we would need some assistance with. Um, the rest is really just uh, on me and Turner putting together the document, making it official. Thanks, Damien. Um... And to give you, if you are interested in being involved in Keep Glendale Beautiful, we're gonna have our first committee meeting for Keep Glendale Beautiful on the 4th of February. And it will be in the evening at five o'clock via Zoom. Um, I can, uh, well, I'm gonna share a different link. So I'm sharing a link to our website. On our website, you can click through to any event that we're holding. So all of our community council meetings for the next year are on there. I will add the Keep Glendale Beautiful committee meeting tonight to make sure that it's on there. Um, but we would love involvement. If it's not you, if it's a neighbor that wants to be involved, please encourage people uh, to come to the meetings, to get involved. Uh, we, we have a lot of different opportunities planned this year. And I wanted to give you that link to our meetings uh, so that you could see them ahead of time. And, and the calendar function allows you to add it to your calendar. It has the Zoom link in it so you can get everything you need uh, on our calendar at that link. Um, I have not seen Representative Romero join yet. So I'm gonna go back to audience. Are there any questions, um, anything we need to discuss or want to discuss? I'm going to put it back out on the floor for just a moment. I think I'd like to help with that uh, uh, monitoring the um, state of the neighborhood thing for the Keep Glendale Beautiful thing, but we'll talk, we can talk about that at that meeting. Okay, yeah. We're doing, we're required to do what's called a litter index. So we'll drive around the neighborhood, identify problem areas. Um, one thing I should have mentioned about Keep America Beautiful and Keep Glendale Beautiful, the reason I'm interested in these national affiliations is twofold. First, we can get national grants and financial support. So we received $1,000 to be able to buy grabbers and gloves and treats and that kind of thing to facilitate these cleanups. And so that's a really nice Thing that we get from Keep America Beautiful. The other thing that they offer is national conferences and trainings. They're actually going to come do a training with us here in person. We've put it off until 
we can go back in person because we they offered to do it digitally, but I just don't feel that's the same experience for folks. I when I'd rather have them come in person when it's safe to do so. And with those trainings, we get the opportunity to go to national conferences and to send a team to represent us. And they have sponsorships and scholarships to make those accessible. And in my life, those type of trainings and so cool. that type of thing changed my life. Oh, the, the, the uh, whole I think it's an important role to play as a community council. Um, Dale, were you trying to say something? Um, in that, who's, I'm getting feedback, I'm sorry. I had a, I had a question. Yeah. Um, I guess who is that available to, like through the, uh, the uh, Key Glendale Beautiful, like the conferences and stuff, is that available to board mem members or? Yeah, it'll uh, be available to anyone who's involved. Um, we, um, I haven't heard of anything because they did everything digitally. So they canceled their conferences through, I think the end of this year, but I'm hoping at the spring of 2022, we can send a good group of people from Glendale to the national conference. They do one, I believe it's in Washington DC every year. And like I said, there's opportunities for, for up, there's other opportunities that come up. And then with welcoming America, the same thing is the case, that once you're a welcoming community, there's grants available for dialogues, for training. Um, so we'll just stay on top of that. And where you're our new treasurer, we'll work on that more and more once we get our IRS uh, letters and documentation back. Oh, OK, cool. Um, and Diane, would you mind, I'm going to put my email in the chat. Would you please email me? To, to talk about Keep Glendale Beautiful so that I have your contact information. Um, and then, Diane, why don't you talk about cars on the parkway? I, uh, do you wanna, do you wanna talk about that? Sure, um, we live right on the parkway and we have had several cars racing by, I'd say, I say racing by, uh, but I would say like at about 25 miles an hour, which on the parkway is racing by. And uh, there used to be, I do believe, a barricade at the south end of the parkway on Brooklyn, where, oh, I'm sorry, on Fremont, where the um, parkway ends at the street there. I Actually, I think it is Brooklyn. And I don't know if you know the location there. Uh, across the river from the Peace Gardens. Yes. Is there anything that can be done about that? I, is Detective Oliver still on? I don't What I'll do, I will follow up with Detective Oliver about this. I'm not sure, um, I, Andrew turned his camera off. I'm not sure if he's still here. Um, but I can, what I can do is I'll circle back and report back to you at the next meeting. And if you email me uh, about Keep Glendale Beautiful, remind me of this and I can forward your email on uh, to find out more about what we can do about it. Okay, what that'd be great. About? It's like in Brooklyn on the street or on the parkway itself? They drive right on the parkway. They enter at Brooklyn uh -huh. because the parkway kind of... Um, <laughs> Almost looks like a tiny street at the Brooklyn there. Yeah, they're going north on the parkway then? And then they go north on the parkway and they usually get off the parkway uh, by the uh, Fife Wetlands. Yeah. There's some, you know, pedestrian curb cuts there. So they get off there. You think they're but, doing it intentionally? Uh, oh, absolutely. They're doing it intentionally. In fact, a couple of times I have wondered if they possibly weren't running from the police or something, I don't know. Yeah, it's a, uh, yeah. Yeah, the entrance is actually on Fremont. It's like that crossing right there at Fremont. And then the, yeah, there you, there's a spot on, like right next to the bridge on Brooklyn where there's the barricade. Do they still have right. the barricade being the ground? 
I think there used to be one of those, I don't know what you call those metal poles that go in the middle of the parkway. Yeah, yeah it's not there. Is there and it's is not there. Is there a hole there in the parkway you can put it into, you think? I think there's something there they can attach it to. I think that's what they do is they kind of attach them or something. Um, Turner, we may want to talk to Parks um, and see if they would have that. I don't know if they took it off for plowing or other maintenance issues, but I think Parks would it's have been out, It's been It's been off. It's been off for probably a couple of years now. It's just that it seems like lately people have been using it more the drive on the parkway. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm wondering if that's a parks issue, Turner. Okay. I can follow up with parks and I'll CC you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else with a question or concern? All right. Well, if uh, there's nothing else, then I think we can consider this meeting over. We're, we're out of our agenda items. I have not heard from Representative Romero. The legislative session started yesterday. So, um, yep, assuming that she got called and pulled away for that. But uh, if there's nothing else, we'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.